Concept number two is that the meaning of mental disorders, psychoanalysis claims, is unconscious. The reason someone is disordered, the reason you may have a symptom or a disorder, is unconscious, you are not aware of it, you cannot figure it out on your own, and you cannot change it on your own. So, in the case that I've just mentioned, Breuer noticed that when his patient would understand, connect what happened in the past with the symptom of today, things would change and symptoms would disappear. Probably the most obvious detail about this. Anna Oh had trouble drinking water. She suffered from what we might call hydrophobia. Everyone was worried about it. It's obvious how important water is and so on. But there was no reason, there was no way to influence her and change anything. One day as she was talking and talking and talking, she stumbled upon, so to say, a memory of seeing a dog drink water from a glass that was put on the floor. And she remembered how disgusted she were of that and how water became disgusting because of that. And immediately Breuer says, as she remembered, the fear and the disgust disappeared and she could start drinking water again. So the basic idea of early psychoanalysis is that as soon as you discover the unconscious meaning of the symptom or the repressed traumatic incident that led to the symptom, the symptom will disappear. That is the beginning of the science. I don't know whether you can recognize this illustration here. It is like a set for the dream scene from Hitchcock's movie Spellbound. If you watch Hitchcock, this is probably, I think, early 1950s, black and white, probably not very popular nowadays. But several of the movies are based on this idea. The solution for the crime will come through the psychoanalytic exploration of the symptoms. And when the main character remembers how the symptoms began, that will solve his neurotic disorder and that will solve the murder mystery. Psychoanalysis is not a discipline. Psychoanalysts are not people who have discovered the concept of the unconscious. Here is just one example. This person here was a rather well-known uh, philosopher of the mid-19th century. One German university nowadays has his name in Gießen or one of the smaller cities. And these are some of the things he wrote at the time when Freud was 10 or 12 years old and when no one like Jung or Ferenc or Melanie Klein were even born. The key to the conscious life lives, lies in the unconscious one. There is absolute, partly and secondary unconscious. The unconscious knows only now, it's tireless, it's always moving, it has its own rules absolutely determined. It does not know any learning. It does not make any mistakes. Consciousness borrows energy and health from the unconscious. And I believe you will very soon see how this is all ingrained in Freud's theory. When you read Freud, everything is there. When you read Grodek and Jung, I think even more. What is the contribution of psychoanalysis then if psychoanalysts did not discover the unconscious? Here are several ways how psychoanalysis, as a method of study, can in a way prove that the unconscious exists. For us nowadays, that may not be such a big point, although if you discuss this with cognitive psychologists, it may still be um, contended, contested. The first point, which Freud considered the royal road to the unconscious, is dreams. You wake up in the morning and you are sure there were some images in your mind while you were asleep. You have no idea where they, where they came from. You have no idea what they might mean. You cannot influence them. You cannot make them appear again or you cannot stop them from appearing the next night again. And psychoanalysts believe if you focus on analyzing those, you will learn a lot about yourself. 
The second one is I mentioned post-hypnotic suggestion. Someone hypnotizes you and tells you, like you may have seen that in Woody Allen movies, you wake up from the hypnosis and then every time you hear a certain word, you start behaving in a completely rational way. Then Freud's famous book, Psychopathology of Everyday Life, how you may make slips in talking, writing, remembering something, you cannot remember your mother's name or her birthday, you cannot remember a friend's name, and it turns out you had a quarrel several days ago, you want to write something, you'll all of a sudden the world is not there that you need, and so on. Freud wrote a book to prove that these slips are not accidental, but unconsciously motivated. Then narratives may be incoherent. Someone asks you to tell something about your childhood, and you can very fluently and easily talk about some memories, and then you come to the moment of a loss or a separation from an important figure, and that is very difficult to talk about. And you see that there is something from the unconscious influencing you. There is a mechanism Freud described in great detail, negation, when you are trying to say that something is not important by saying the first thing, someone asks you, what may, might be important about that? And the first thing you say, well, this definitely is not important. So by saying it's not, you actually say that unconsciously you know it is. Then things that you have repressed and symptoms, like this is probably not, not the best illustration of the PTSD-related um, symptom of uh, returning the memories and, and, and scenes from the traumatic incident. So you see that in the night, during the dream or in the day, you are like brought back to the moment when something horrible happened. You feel you are at that place, you feel you are surrounded by those people, you feel actually at that moment something horrible is going on. There is no way for it to be brought into you from the outside. It obviously was somewhere in the unconscious and by some trigger uh, made relevant again. So uh, I assume many movies, for instance, about Vietnam War uh, show that as, as a clear illustration. So we believe by now that we have several ways to prove that the unconscious exists and more, moreover, that the unconscious influences us and it is an important factor when it comes to our current decisions and choices and what we, what we want to do or say at a certain moment. There are several models in the world of psychoanalysis that should tell us what the unconscious is. This is the famous iceberg metaphor. It is supposed to show that what you can see on the above and what is your conscious mind is very limited and has very little influence when it comes to where this iceberg is going to move and whether it's going to move at all. The unconscious mind is this huge part below the surface that you cannot see, that you may be completely unaware of, but that influences your life incomparably more powerfully than the conscious mind can. How did we come to the idea that the unconscious can be something we can talk about in psychological terms? If you think again about the dog and water in the case of Anna O, oh, the question you may raise is where were the memories in the meantime? Something horrible happens, you forget about it, you develop symptoms, but where does the memory disappear and where from does it appear again? So, one of the ideas about the unconscious was that it's like a huge depot, a huge storage space where you put whatever you don't want to think about, whatever you don't want to be uh, aware of. And now the revolutionary idea described at the beginning of the 20th century is the idea of the dynamic unconscious. So before roughly the year 1900, unconscious was described in many ways but it was never clearly shown that the unconscious actually influences the conscious 
that these are not just two descriptions of two spaces, so to say, that exist in parallel. But this one influences this one very strongly and then psychoanalysts try to describe how, through which mechanisms. And then what can we do about that? In the early 1920s, this is the structural model that was offered as an explanation of what the unconscious looks like, what it consists of, that is nowadays still very influential in the world of psychoanalysis. It is supposed to consist of three instances, one completely unconscious, where our drives and our biological makeup is, one partly conscious, but mostly unconscious, the ego, your I, the instance that's trying to negotiate with the social environment and the inner environment and try to find a plan as to how life may, might go on. And the superego, where your conscious, your ideals, your uh, preferences are, this one tells you all the time that satisfaction should arrive immediately. And this one tells you all the time that satisfaction is not ethical, decent, polite, uh, good, prepared at that moment, and so on and so on. So there is a lot of pressure on the ego from one, two, and then the, the external environment as the third tyrant, so to say. The two models overlap to a certain extent, but not too much. The basic fact about the unconscious when it comes to psychoanalysis is conflict. However psychoanalysts may differ in their understanding of the unconscious, they always think there is a conflict in there. If, if some of you have studied psychology, you may remember the story about the humanistic psychology as a reaction to this dark side of psychoanalysis and a psychological model that is conflict-free where people are understood to be able to live without the conflict. Not so in psychoanalysis. So there are various types of conflicts that psychoanalysts have tried to describe. As I've mentioned a minute before, the unconscious against the conscious. Then memories or representations that are in the, in the unconscious that are trying to return from this zone, repressed, but there is the censorship barrier which will not allow the memories or the images to return to the consciousness. So that's another form of conflict. So then there's drives, as I mentioned, and prohibitions. You'd like all of the toys to be yours and your parents will not allow you. You'd like all of the Nutella that exists in the world to be yours, but your parents hopefully will not allow you. Then there's drives and defense mechanisms like repression, rationalization, denial, and so on. In the opinion of some psychoanalysts, defense mechanisms exist to somehow put drives under a little bit of control. Drives are always more powerful, but defenses are trying somehow to deal with them. There is a very important description of two basic principles that govern the human mind. One being the pleasure principle, the principle that wants satisfaction immediately. And the other being the reality principle, which says, okay, let's consider the circumstances, let's make a plan, and then let's see what we can get. What is realistic to expect at this moment? Freud described those in 1911, and probably 80 years later, or about, 80 or 90 years later, I, I, I don't know the exact year, one now very famous person won the Nobel Prize for Economy by describing a dual process theory where there are two principles which, to my mind, and I believe some other people would agree, sound completely the same as Freud has described them here. Then there is the idea of drives being in conflict among themselves. In the end, Freud believed there were two. Some other psychoanalysts believed there were more. In the beginning, Freud also believed there were more. 
One that was constant in the thinking of psychoanalysts is libido, the sexual drive. And then several other drives were supposed to oppose it. While in the end Freud would describe the conflict between libido and death drive. And there are many other ideas like drive towards uh, knowledge, curiosity and so on. And, and many other ideas later on. If you look at psychoanalytic descriptions of what is the basic thing you will find in the unconscious, then I believe there are four different conceptions. This is like a chronological organization of it. The first one was that if you'd be able to look into the unconscious of every human being, Freud believed anywhere in the world, what you'd find there is basically sexuality and what Freud liked to call Oedipus complex. A child in the age between three and five, all of a sudden having very, very tender feelings for the parent of the opposite gender and feeling rivalry or jealousy or hate toward the parent of the same gender. And this triangular situation where the child has completely different emotions and attitudes toward different parents and is aware that parents have a relationship of their own, completely different than the relationship the child has with, with either of them, is something psychoanalysis in the early decades thought was the basic pattern of our unconscious. A hugely important discovery at that time that made psychoanalysis both famous and notorious, and also a limiting attitude because there's most probably so much else in the unconscious. The second point is that if you'd be able to look at the unconscious, what you'd see is destruction. You would find the death drive, not just as a metaphor, not just as a poetic or philosophical notion, but as something that is a part of your organism and your psyche that is working all the time, that is making you aggressive or afraid, and that you don't know what to do about, especially when you're very small. In the domain of child psychoanalysis, there were descriptions of object relations and defenses small children must use because the death drive is working all the time and they're not strong enough psychologically to defend from it. This is another very controversial point in the world of psychoanalysis because probably at least one half of the psychoanalytic community does not consider death drive to be something realistic, while the other one considers it to be the focal point of everything. The third uh, possibility is that when you look in the unconscious, what you will find is that humans, per definition, are dependent on other people in uh, bad circumstances or with bad outcomes on substances that we cannot survive, survive without the others and that there are many different psychological mechanisms we are using in order to gain something from other people, to attract them to communication, to develop this communication and so on. But that until the end of our lives we are never completely independent. Hopefully, as adults, we will not be as dependent as we were in childhood or in infancy, but we will always need other people in order to be human beings. And finally, the most recent formulation that I'm aware of is the idea that the unconscious is just a set of unformulated experiences. Things were happening to you, you didn't know what to do with them, either they were too fast, or they were too painful, or no one told you, no one showed you how to deal with them. And then being unformulated, unspoken, un, not introduced into a dialogue with other people, they remain, remain in fog, they remain unformulated, and you don't know what to do with them. Here, the unconscious is not a space where you're putting something. It is not a part of your personality. These are just experiences you had no idea what to do with.